think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our third installment of our Equine Science Center webinar series. We are so glad that you all took time out of your evenings to join us um, for these, this educational series. Yet we have the privilege of hosting uh, Dr. Leslie Serafin. Dr. Serafin is a District Epidemiology Officer with USD APHIS Veterinary Services. She received her DBM from Purdue University in 1984 and her MPH from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, now part of Rutgers University in 2004. Dr. Serafin wrote several biosecurity fact sheets for USDA, including biosecurity tips for horse owners. And this evening, Dr. Serafin will present on biosecurity for the horse owner. Her talk will focus on actions that you can take to prevent disease entry to and spread on your farm, including actions to take when attending off-farm equine events. So at this time, I am happy to turn over the presentation to Dr. Leslie Serafin. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, this is, a, this is a, a new method for me with Zoom, so um, bear with me when my parrot talks or my dogs bark, but hopefully it will be okay. Um, also, before I begin this presentation, this presentation is going to focus on what you can do on your farm, and then if you take your horse out of the farm to an equine event, what you should do. If you are an equine event planner, you're someone who plans a big horse show or helps run a big horse show, I do have another presentation on things that should be done to plan for biosecurity and plan for outbreaks at large horse shows. Um, if any of you would like me to speak on that at a future date, at the end of this presentation, my contact information will be there and it's your tax dollars at work, so I will, will come and do that. Okay, so for, whoops, where did the slide go? My slides are not advancing. Nope. It should. I'm just going to stop sharing one second and try this again. Okay. Now my slides are not advancing. Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Uh, so do you, are you trying to advance it once you've selected, um, I'm assuming you're running it through PowerPoint? Yep. So is your PowerPoint window open or is your Zoom window open? Well, I'm not sure if it needs to be done via the Zoom window. Okay, hang on a minute. That is my, pe oh, oh, okay, wait a minute, here we go. That should work, let's see what happens. Now I have to see how to get back to Zoom, sorry guys. No, no worries. All right, there's PowerPoint. Here's Zoom. I will share my screen. Yay, now it's working. Is it working for you guys? It is. Perfect. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. See, I told you I was doing this. I think a lot of us now know because of COVID what biosecurity is, but just in case. So bio means life, like biology, and security just means safety or keeping something safe. So biosecurity are actions that you can take to prevent your horses from getting sick and then also to help prevent disease spreading. So we've all learned about safety precautions in this time of COVID. And your horse can't wear a respirator and it can't wash its hooves. Well, maybe if you walk it through a foot bath. <laughs> so really for your horse, it's the stable manager and horse owner's responsibility to keep diseases from entering the farm and from spreading on the farm. And biosecurity practices can't prevent all horse diseases. You know, say there's, there's something that comes in, you know, on the feet of wild starlings. Well, how the heck are you going to keep wild starlings out of the field? You know, you're, you're you're just not going to. So you're not going to prevent everything, but it will prevent a lot of diseases. And they can help prevent the contagious illnesses from coming in and from spreading. To give you an example of when biosecurity didn't work, 
So I'm high risk for COVID. So my husband and I, especially at the beginning, were super, super careful. I don't go anywhere. He was spraying himself with Lysol, rinsing out his nose, you know, wearing N95 masks. And guess what? I still got a cold. I didn't even see anyone else. How the heck did I get a cold virus? Because you can't prevent everything. So this, this slide shows the epidemiological triad, and it has a, a vector in the middle for diseases that are borne by vectors like mosquitoes or ticks. Um, and so in order for a disease to spread, you have to have all the things that are on this diagram. So if you don't have the agent in the environment, right, if there's, if there's no strangles around, the horse isn't going to get strangles. If the environment is wrong, say it's really, really cold and it's a virus doesn't like really cold, well, then the agent's not gonna survive. And if you don't have a host to get sick, you're not gonna have illness either. So you could have strangles in the environment on your farm, but if you don't have a horse, nobody's gonna get strangles. Many other, so if you take out any one of these, right, no, then disease doesn't happen. But many other things factor into horse getting sick. So sometimes you'll wonder, gosh, I had a whole barn of horses, how come this one got sick and none of the others did? Um, lots of different factors. Some it has to do with the individual horse itself. Some people and some animals are just more susceptible to, to diseases. And then also other factors play a role. So was the horse recently stressed by something else? Say you have a horse that's getting over strangles and it gets exposed to equine herpes, it may be more likely to get that because its immune system is stressed. Or maybe it had you know, a really bad case of, of rain rot, and now it gets exposed to some, some other virus or bacterial infection. Um, the weather can also affect if a horse will get sick because it's stressed. So if it's really, really cold out and that horse is trying to stay warm, its, it's immune system may not be at the tip top because their body is, is working against other stresses. So, what are ways that horses can get exposed? So they can get exposed through direct contact with another infected animal, through indirect contact, so through something called a fomite, which I'll talk about later. Um, sometimes, you know, through the air, through grazing, um, on, on implements, if you share tack or you share grooming equipment, all those things can, can expose your horse. So, um, and then, you know, we have fact to factor in things like biting flies and ticks. Now, I did want to just briefly speak about COVID and horses. In animals, we're calling, the, we're calling it SARS-CoV-2 infection. That's the name of the, the short name of the virus. COVID-19 is the disease people get. So animals are getting SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, I don't know of any, the number of horses that have been tested worldwide. I actually don't know how many in the US have been tested. I do know that some horses in the US have been tested though for SARS-CoV-2. There have been no positive horses in the US. Um, we have a bunch of positive dogs, cats, some mink farms, and uh, lion and lions and tigers at, at one zoo. That, and that all of those animals got it from infected people. Um, so we don't have any reports of horses getting sick from this. And experimentally, very, very few horses were in the experiment, but they didn't seem to be susceptible to the virus. There are precautions on the CDC website for people that aren't, get COVID-19 of what to do to protect their pets. And I think some of those things would probably apply for horses. You know, even though we don't know that they get it, there's a lot about this disease that we don't know. So if you know that you have COVID, if you test positive, um, don't, don't kiss your horse, don't snuggle with your horse's face, and don't, you know, like take the bite of the carrot and then give it to the horse, because that's the virus transferring. Horses have a little advantage, I think, that like my dogs are in the house with me all the time. Horses are outside and generally, even if they're in a barn and there's good airflow. So that's gonna keep moving and diluting the virus that's in the air. Um, so in this triad, what's missing for SARS-CoV-2? Probably the horse, because they probably don't get it. So we're going to talk about some examples of direct and indirect contact. Um, we're getting back to regular diseases now. 
And so some spread by direct or indirect contact. They don't need a vector to transmit the disease and the disease agent doesn't have to go through a vector and change. Like some of the equine encephalitis has to actually go into the mosquito. So um, I was gonna ask a question here, but I can, we, we can just keep going. So direct contact is when horses can touch each other nose to nose. So that could be um, in a pasture, over a fence line, um, if they're in stalls and the stalls walls don't go all the way to the ceiling, they can lift their nose up and touch. And I once had a disease investigation um, at a racetrack where they were in shed row barns and horses on opposite sides of the shed rows and they, they open out, got, got this infection. Well, then I went and looked at the stalls and one of the stalls had a hole in the wall about like this. So yeah, the horses had direct contact right through that stall wall. Indirect contact um, is when a horse gets exposed to another horse by something that it touched. So in this picture, you have the people petting the horse. Now, if they go down and pet another horse, that's gonna be indirect contact. It, the, whatever it is could be on their hands. The uh, water trough, especially this one, this child has a number on it, right? She's wearing a number, he or she is wearing a show number. So this is at a horse show. If that's a communal horse trough, that horse has now been exposed to every other horse that drank out of that trough today. And that, that's a big one for spreading equine herpes myeloencephalopathy. Um, horse washing, if you go to, and I'll show later on, if there's a, a wash stall, um, if people don't clean and disinfect between, then your horse is still getting exposed to every horse that's been there. Maybe minimally, especially if there's cross ties and they're not putting their face down, but they, they still could. Okay, now we've all learned from COVID that asymptomatic people can spread disease um, and animals are no different. For many, many illnesses, in fact, you're shedding the most agent within the 24 to 48 hours before you develop symptoms. So if you say, you know, well, I wouldn't take my horse to the showground if it were sick. So the, the black horse here, I don't know that if you can see, but there's like some discharge around its nostrils and a little crustiness. Um, so that one you might say, okay, he's got some mucopurulent discharge. Uh, maybe I can feel if his lymph nodes are swollen. I can't, ima can't think of anything. It's not allergy time, so maybe I won't take him. The horse on the bottom, I think if he showed up at a showgrounds with that, people would have a fit. <laughs> they would make you leave with that amount of mucopurulent mucopurulent discharge. And the sorrel horse with the blaze, it's like a normal young horse to me. I don't see anything with that. That horse was actually infected with EHM and was shedding tons of virus. So that's why it's very important for you to know your horse's normal temperature. About five days to a week before you're gonna go off of the farm with your horse, take its temperature every day. Um, same time of day is the best. So if your horse is stalled first thing in the morning or even twice a day, if it's you know in the stall, goes out to pasture and then comes back in at night, just get to know what's your horse's normal temperature. You don't want to do it like right after you've been riding because the temperature will probably be up. But um, you know, just like people's normal can vary. You know, everybody says um, 98.6 is a normal temperature. Well, my normal is 97.6. So if I have a temperature of 99, that's probably a little fever for me. It may be the same for your horse. Your horse may run high, may run kind of high temperatures all the time. After you get back from the show, continue taking your horse's temperature for about two weeks just to make sure they didn't pick up anything at the show. Okay, so th this part, you guys can type in an answer for me. Um, what are some horse diseases that would spread from, from direct horse to horse contact? Maybe what are some ways they were spread, they could spread and um, what are some diseases? And just so you know, the horse on the right, the, the I guess I, I would call her a seal bay. I think her registration paper said brown. Um, she was a standard bred that I had from the New Jersey Standard Bread Rescue. Um, so she, I ended up getting sick and couldn't keep her. She has another home now. But um, standard, I'll give a plug to them because standard breads can have other jobs. Do we, have any, do we have any answers? Okay. 
Okay, so not hearing any, I'll just continue. We Director have, a, I'm sorry, Dr. Serafin, it's okay. a little bit of a delay there. We have strangle, strangle, strangles and influenza. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> strangle, strangles would be the first one I would think of. So things can spread by saliva. So if they eat, you know, touch each other with their mouths, nibble on their, their withers, um, it can be through nasal discharge, through urine, through feces, um, although that's more indirect, I guess, um, and breeding. So I had down strangles, rabies, right? Being bitten, rabies, contagious equine metritis, which is through, through breeding, influenza, equine herpes virus, strangles, strangles, strangles. Thank you. <laughs> and then can you tell me what are some horse diseases that would be spread by vectors like flies or ticks? Uh, we've got West Nile virus, summer sore, Lyme. Yep. Equine encephalitis, uh, EIA. Limes, West Nile, E E E W E E V E E E P M. Yep. Yep. E P M. Yep. Yep. Those are good. Um, because in vectors, a lot of times people will think about, you know, flies and ticks, and some of them are mechanical vectors; they just carry the agent, and some of them the agent actually has to go through them and change but they don't necessarily always think about wildlife vectors. So I'm glad someone mentioned EPM um, and, and sort of, I guess, like a, a rabid raccoon in a way could be a vector. And I had down EIA, pyroplasmosis, all of the equine encephalitis and Potomac horse fever. Okay, and what are some, some horse diseases that can spread by fomites? And a fomite is an object or, um, or some kind of material that can, can carry the infection, usually on its surface. So it would be things like grooming equipment, um, tack, your shoes, your hands, um, and your dog's paws and fur. So what are some diseases that could be spread that way? Thank you for participating too. I stole this picture from somebody else, so I, I don't even remember who. <laughs> We've got fungus, strangles again. Yep. So I had strangles, rhino, flu, botulism, because it could be in the hay, right? Intestinal parasites. If you walk through a field and you get some manure on your feet, and you walk through another field, you can be spreading those worm eggs. The dog's feet can do the same thing, and it doesn't even have to take that much manure stuck from it. Um, so, you know, it's it's lots lots of different inanimate objects as well. Okay, so now we're going to get into what are the essential things that you need to do for for good biosecurity. What are good biosecurity actions for your farm? And probably the number one biosecurity action for your horse is to keep your horse healthy. If your horse is healthy and it, its immune system will be stronger and it can fight off more disease. Um, this involves the proper feed. So that's the right feed for the right life stage and the right use of the animals. Um, proper housing, that the horse has a, has a dry place out of the weather where it can go to sleep, especially if it's outside all the time. Um, vaccinations to prevent infections that are preventable, a proper worming schedule, and watching for par um, resistant parasites, and then anything that you can do to decrease stress on that horse. So what I, what I tell pet owners when I was in practice is it's your job to keep your pet ha happy. So it's kind of your job to keep your horse happy. Because if your horse is very anxious and worried all the time, they're, they're not going to fight off diseases as well that they might get. So you're going to help your horse stay the healthiest it can so it can fight off disease. So then the next thing you have to do is keep disease off of 
your farm or where your horse lives. Um, so you, you, you need to keep your horse from getting exposed. Think of that triad again. So we have the horse and it's healthy, but now it has to get exposed to the agent. If you board your horse someplace, you need to be sure did the place, or if you are someone who does board horses, require vaccinations, require a note from the vet, if the vet gave the vaccinations or from the owner saying when the horse was given vaccinations, what they were given and the, um, the maker of the vaccine as well. So they have some good proof to you that they actually did vaccinate the horse. And then you also wanna have um, an equine infectious anemia or Coggins test. Coggins is a specific kind of EIA test, but um, you wanna have the horse tested for EIA and Think about this, when you brought your horse to where you're boarding, did they ask to see proof of vaccinations? Did they ask for an EIA test chart and make sure it matched the horse that you're bringing in? Because if they didn't do that for you, they probably didn't do it for anybody else either. And what level of risk are you taking? Um, I was once at a barn where I bled, I think we bled 50 or 60 horses that night until three o'clock in the morning because um, a horse that had been out being tried by different places for purchase as a riding horse came back to this stable and was stabled with all the other kids, ponies and show horses, and that horse was positive for equine infectious anemia. And we were out there bleeding horses till three in the morning so we could get the test to the lab the next day because horses were supposed to be going to shows. And we actually had to quarantine the whole barn. So, you know, if, it's, if something is not an acceptable risk to you, if they didn't ask you about it, then that means they probably didn't ask anybody. Um, other things you need to do is, you know, have a good worming program, especially for new horses. And um, the number one way, I should have said this at the beginning, sorry, the number one way that new diseases enter a farm is through the entry of a new animal. And I don't mean like a foal being born on the farm, but a new horse or something coming into a premises. And that's, that's number one. Um, you wanna isolate new horses. And if a horse has been off the farm into a show, if you can, you also wanna isolate them. Keep all delivery trucks. So if you have feed and hay delivery, try to keep them as far away from the horse area as you can. Um, you know, if there's a way that they can park at one end of the barn to unload feed and hay, and that's not the end people usually come into with their horses, keep trash pickup as far to the end of the barn driveway as you can so that they're not having to come right up close to the barn um, to, to get that. If you end up having to euthanize a horse, if there's a way, again, you can euthanize it near the edge of the farm so the dead stock hauler doesn't have to drive through the area where everybody drives their cars and people walk because they've been every place. And so can't always do these things, but um, I'm recommending the best that you can, can do. Okay, so that's preventing disease in production. Now, suppose this new horse that came in did bring a disease with it. How are you gonna keep that disease from spreading to all the other horses on, on your farm? Um, and there are things that you can do every day so that in case disease came in, it wouldn't be spread. So you wanna kind of restrict movement between horses. If a horse is sick, you wanna isolate that horse very quickly. And later on, we'll talk about the difference between isolation and quarantine. Um, you want to keep vectors under control, keep the ticks and mosquitoes and rodents and things under control so that they're not acting to carry diseases between groups of horses. If you do have horses that are out in pastures, you know, keeping them in their own group is helpful so that they're, they may be exposed to their own horses and maybe the pasture next to them if they can touch over the fence, but they're not gonna be, you know, exposed to the horses that are in the backfield. Um, just kind of reduce that contact. Gosh, sounds a lot like returning to school in COVID, doesn't it? Um, and then also, when, when if you don't have a lot of people coming and going from your farm, think about clean and dirty areas so that once you step over this line, which is where the horses cross all the time, that's the clean line. And I don't want lots of other traffic and people in that area. So when the vet comes, they need to park you know, over near that other end of the barn and walk here. Barrier, it's a little trickier, but 
again, you do, you do what you can. Um, you want to have dedicated uh, equipment, and especially if you have dedicated equipment for specific horses, that's always very good as well, so you're not sharing equipment and sharing germs. And you want to have a manure storage area that prevents leakage of, of any fluids or wet manure to where the horses are. And we're gonna we'll talk about this a little more. Okay, so you need to develop a specific biosecurity program for your farm or, and your horse um, because every farm is a little different. The other thing that's a little different is what I may think is way too much risk. Another person, you know, might think that's no risk at all. And that's why any recommendations for biosecurity and developing a farm biosecurity plan really should talk to you in terms of what's the risk if you don't do this? What's, you know, how much do you decrease the risk if you do this? Uh, for example, my horse always got vaccinated for botulism. Had never had a case of it on the farm. I don't think it happens very often, but if she got it and I hadn't vaccinated her, I couldn't live with myself. On the flip side, I, I breed and show dogs. I know dog breeders that don't vaccinate for rabies. To them, that's a negligible risk. So <laughs> that's, that's where risk makes a, makes a big difference. Um, there are lots of resources for developing a farm biosecurity online. Uh, and you can, you can just you know, Google horse farm biosecurity. I also, at the end of the presentation, have some websites you can write down. Um, Rutgers University and Cooperative Extension, the County Ag Agents, they may be able to help you. And your veterinarian might be able to help you. They, they should be, it's whether they have time, but hopefully they will if they're coming out to do, you know, routine inspections or, or draw Coggins tests on all the horses in the barn. You know, maybe you can discuss parts of your biosecurity plan with them. So, when you're developing a plan, especially for, for public horse health education, it, you can't have something really overwhelming. I mean, I could give you a 30-page document on what you should be doing on your farm, but if instead I give you a document that has maybe four or five things with subtopics under that, you'll remember it better and it's just, just more approachable to you. So, Key points would be keep disease out, keep your horse healthy, prevent spread you know, by controlling vectors. So you might have something under that like keep your horse healthy and make sure they have the proper, as we talked about, food, shelter, water, exercise, vaccinations, rodents and wildlife, you know, um, keep trash picked up, mow the grass, mow, you know, mow pastures, especially keep the, the grass around fence lines trimmed down. Ticks love that longer grass to climb up on. Between the woods and the pasture, keep that grass short because that edge of the woods thing is what ticks love to climb up on. Um, keep your food in rodent proof bins. If you spill it, sweep it up right away. And um, walk around and look for trash, even a bottle cap of water can, can breed mosquitoes. So as I say, see, that's a lot of things I've just told you. But if I just said reduce vectors, oh yeah, that's right, that means we need to, then, then it's easier for you to remember. So you can, as again, you can look online for biosecurity questionnaires. Um, and what you want to do is <clears throat> you can take a checklist or one of the questionnaires and walk through your form. Sometimes it's good if a couple of you can do it together because one person, you know, two sets of eyes is always better than one. And then use the answers to make a biosecurity plan. You might want to go over it again with your vet or your extension agent um, and just, just talk about, you know, maybe did I, did I miss anything or how big of a risk is this really going to be? Um, I am working on a biosecurity checklist right now that I started last year and Dr. Malinowski's Equine Science 101 class um, pre-tested it for me on the farm there at Rutgers. I need to do some more tweaking to it and a little more pre-testing and again I really hope to make it risk-based and, and more straightforward. So you know if you don't 
keep that grass by the fence line trimmed down, what is the risk? You know, there's certainly a risk your horse will get ticks, but then what's the risk that it will get a tick-borne disease? And, it, and it, that will depend also on what area where you live. Um, some farms will be able to do, the, the checklist that I'm making is like the ideal. Some farms, some of those things will just be absolutely impossible. If I had a farm and it was only my horses, I could probably restrict a lot of movement, and make a really good clean, dirty line. Um, a farm that has borders and people are coming in all the time to ride their horses, that's going to be harder. Rutgers found there was a lot of things that I would have wanted them to do that just as a university, they can't. You know, they, they have lots of people coming in, students coming up, and uh, they hold events there, and events that are open to the public. And so there was a lot of things they just couldn't do. Make sure that you do have a place for people to wash their hands. That's really important. And um, the places people most often miss are in red here. And I thought the back of your thumb was kind of an interesting, interesting place. When I took my MPH program, they talked about studies where they set up cameras in restrooms and watch how often do people wash their hands and how are they washing them? Or are they washing them properly? So now every time I go into a public restroom, I'm convinced they're watching me with a camera and I wash my hands really well. Okay, so I'd like some answers to these. Um, so you, you decide you're going to you know, take your horse's temperature, either because you're going to be going to a show or maybe it has that, you know, a little bit of snotty nose so you want to see. And it's temperature 102. What would be the first thing you would do for that horse with a fever? And then what if, you know, a horse, you go up and you haven't felt it yet to see that it feels hot, but you notice it has a snotty nose. What's the first thing you're going to do? And I'll take some answers to those. Thompson says, call the vet. Elaine <laughs> says, N says, and isolate. Yeah, oh, yay, isolate, yay, yay. And N says, yep, very good. If a horse has a fever, the very first thing you want to do is isolate that horse because you don't want it spreading it to any other horses, direct contact, indirect contact, whatever. Something's not normal, it's, it looks infectious, let's isolate that horse. If a horse has a snotty nose, the first thing you might do is take its temperature, but then, yeah, you're going to isolate it because if it has a snotty nose, it's probably something that can spread through the air by respiratory secretions. Now, the difference between isolation and quarantine. Isolation is when you keep a horse separate from other horses with no direct or indirect contact. So, you know, you're going to have dedicated equipment and stuff so that you're not going to have any indirect contact. And you also probably need to have it in a stall. We recommend at least 30 feet away from other horses because of airborne things. We'll talk a little more about the isolation stall. Quarantine is a regulatory restriction placed on an animal's movement or on all the animals on the farm by a regulatory authority. So that would be like if the state vet, Dr. Tomasia, if one of his veterinarians came out or animal health technicians and they quarantine your horse or they quarantine your farm. That's regulatory and a law and that's the difference. So every barn should have an isolation kit because you never know when a horse is going to need to be isolated and um, in this part, when I, when I gave this to Dr. Malinowski's class, we actually talked about things that, that should be in there, but I'll skip to the next slide so we don't, we don't have to answer all of that. Um, but in this picture, you wanna have the, the isolation kit equipment stored in something that's marked. It should be waterproof, as rodent proof as you can. I mean, can they chew through a plastic bin? Yes, but if there's no food in there, they're really not gonna be trying to do that, rodents. Um, and, other workers in the barn need to know where it is. And if you board, then some, some, some of the um, horse owners should know where your isolation kit is so that it could be set up very quickly. Because isolating that horse as quickly as you can is gonna reduce the amount of spread. That's, to me, that, that horse is high risk and getting it away from everybody else, that's a risk that, you, yeah, if you can 
make that risk very low, do it. So isolation. First thing you want to do, and this picture doesn't really show it, is you want the stall that that horse is in and the area around it to look really different. So for example, you might set up cones with, with uh, yellow tape on them or cones with white chains and hang some signs that say something like, um, isolated horse, do not enter, please contact. And then have, you know, whether it's the barn manager or the horse owner's name. But a physical barrier that's gonna make, not that they can't just step over it or move a cone, but something that's gonna make them say, oh, what's going on here? Something's different about this area. Then in the isolation itself, you want to have, you can see on the stall, there's a clipboard for recording temperatures and if the horse is having any medications, you could have a checklist if they were given. Um, there's hand sanitizer on this stall. There's pens and Sharpies so that you could write with. They've put a box of um, gloves right on the stall. I think this was at a vet school, but still, these are, these are good things to do. Um, they have a little bin on there where they can put things they need, bandages, syringes, fly spray, wipes. There's a, that red barrel, I believe, is supposed to be a foot bath. Um, you want to have hand, I said hand sanitizer. Um, and maybe even in your kit, you should have some paper or cardboard so that you can make an isolation sign. Obviously, you want to have a thermometer. And um, then you should also have dedicated clothes and footwear because you don't want to be wearing the same clothes and treating the sick horse and then go work with a well horse. So here they have a doctor's coat. I would recommend a pair of coveralls or even disposable coveralls. Um, and then you could have some disinfectable rubber boots. I generally prefer real rubber boots to like the disposable plastic ones. The plastic ones are slippery, they make a lot of noise and they also wear through very quickly. The disposable Tyvek coveralls are also white, which some horses don't like, and they, they kind of rustle and make noise. So around horses, I prefer to wear cloth coveralls. And then um, the boots that I have are tingly boots, and they're, they're not the ones that I wear when I'm like normally working on the farm. I want something with better grips on the bottom, but those are easy to wash, and you can even throw them in the washing machine, which is what I like about them. For a foot bath, I'm going to give you some, some tips here. One of the easiest foot baths, especially if you're having not only an isolated horse, but say you're having an open house at your farm. You can take a, a tub, whether it's a plastic wash tub or whatever you have, and get one of those um, welcome mats that looks like fake grass or the ones that are like kind of um, like a, a rush material, like the, I guess it's a plant material. And put the disinfectant, put the mat in the tub, put the disinfectant water in, and make it so that when people step on the mat, they have to wipe their feet and that it will just get kind of up to the sides of their boots. You don't have to make it so people are dunking their whole foot in an entire bucket. Maybe for an isolated horse, that's a good idea, but for a general foot bath, probably not. For the isolated horse, probably not because you're going to have dedicated footwear there anyway. The idea of wiping their feet is if there's any organic material on there, disinfectants don't work through organic material, most disinfectants. So by making them wipe their feet, you're removing any dirt and manure that might be on their feet. As far as what to use, um, bleach and water, one part bleach to nine parts water, so like one cup of household laundry detergent bleach to nine cups of water, works for most horse things. The problem with that is it doesn't work in the presence of organic material. So if people have a lot of mud and manure on their feet, it's not going to work. Um, so in that case, you would want to look for a disinfectant that says it will work in the presence of organic material. Um, we've used One Stroke Environ and Tectrol, but I'm sure there are others out there as well. What do you do in the winter if the foot bath is freezing? Can't really use a foot bath then. Some of the disinfectant sprays work pretty good. And believe it or not, good old Lysol spray works against a lot of things that we would be worried about for horses. So spray until the surface of your boots are wet, especially underneath. Let it stand there a minute before you walk in with the horses. If you're using a foot bath, how often should you change that? Read the instructions on the disinfectant. For bleach, it's every two to three hours, believe it or not, or it starts to lose some strength. 
If it's really dirty looking, you might need to do it sooner than that. Okay, so now we're gonna take your horse off the farm onto a horse show and think about all the indirect contact with other horses that can happen at a horse show. Um, I had a 4-H club when my kids were younger. They're, they're all in their late 20s now. And my kids were like maniacs about the biosecurity stuff because their leader was a veterinary epidemiologist. You know, they, they just had to, to learn this. So um, going from kind of the left to the right, that horse is standing at the fence waiting for its turn in the dressage ring. Well, its nose is touching the fence. If that halflinger had been there previously, that, that brown horse is now exposed to whatever that halflinger had. In the middle pictures are two pictures of um, a trailer. If you're having someone else haul your horse for you, this is especially important. The trailer on the left looks pretty clean. Um, there is some hay or straw in there that really should be swept out. And the trailer on Maybe they're the same. The trailer on the right, I can't, it, that looks like it could be some manure staining or something on the walls. There's kind of a dark spot on the door that could have been where a horse rubbed or manure rubbing. Um, there's pictures on the wall. How did you disinfect the pictures unless they're in plastic? My thing that I use, so in my job, I have to go when horses are coming into the airport they, that have been imported to the US. They have to go into a cleaned and disinfected horse trailer. They cannot go into a dirty horse trailer. What I tell all of the haulers is, if I can smell horse when I step in that van, you didn't clean and disinfect it properly. Now just using pine saw, which is strong, pine saw doesn't get all the things we're worried about. So no, that's not good. And if you use too strong of a bleach solution, it's gonna eat up your trailer and it might you know, bother the horse's nose. But you shouldn't see any manure staining or dirt and you really should not smell horses when you step in there. Other thing that a lot of um, show brands will have if you're gonna stay there with your horse is they put up temporary stalls for you to use. Have you ever been at a horse show when they're taking those stalls down? They're supposed to wash and disinfect them. I'm sure some places do a fabulous job at it, but some don't. So when you take your horse off grounds to a show, bring things with you to clean and disinfect that temporary stall. So have some detergent, regular laundry detergent, a scrub brush, spray it with a hose, you know, dilute the detergent in a bucket, scrub down the wall to remove any organic matter that you can, and then rinse it. And then you can spray it with a dilution of bleach and water Again, you wanna make sure that enough contacts the wall that the wall gets wet and the floor as well. Um, because you, you could be picking up diseases that way. This way you've done it. So again, your risk. I've done this hundreds of times. My horse has never gotten sick. My risk, I know I should do it. If my horse got sick, I couldn't live with myself. So <laughs> other risks, borrowed equipment and tech. Um, always bring extras when you're going off the farm. Do not borrow from somebody else. That's what we teach all the 4-H kids. And then maybe they forget to bring the extra things and we end up borrowing. Um, one of the big ones for my 4-H kids was this picture of the bucket. Never put the hose in the bucket. On your own farm, you shouldn't even do this. That hose then is contaminated by whatever was in that bucket. And then the next person goes to use the hose and does the same thing and, and spreads it to their horse. You want to hold that hose above the bucket so that the water's going in, but the hose isn't touching the bucket. As added insurance, and, and my 4-H kids got made fun of for this, we brought disinfectant wipes with us, like Clorox wipe, wiped the hose off, the common hose off, and then held it above the bucket. But you know, again, my kids were the vet's kids, so they kind of had to. The wash stall at the show grounds they really should have a sign there, hang up the hose when you're finished. There should be a way to maybe squeegee some extra water, um, disinfect the end of the hose. Just, you know, make sure your horse isn't touching someplace that it could pick up a disease. In the picture of, of my horse down at the bottom, in, in, on the bottom right with the water being sprayed on her, 
well, it was a common tie place. Did I disinfect the ends of those cross ties before I put them on her halter? No. How likely is she to contact them? Eh. But if I only sprayed her a little and another horse had saliva on that and it ran down her face, yeah. Um, the horse that is um, grazing, all the time I see people letting their horses graze right next to the show ring. You've now exposed your, your horse to every horse that has been there. Um, bring, bring extra everything. If all the horses at a show are from your farm and one kid forget something and needs to borrow it and those horses have the same health status, that's okay. But don't borrow from someone else from a horse from a different farm. So the other thing is that all horses should be individually identified to go to a horse event. Main thing that most people use is the EIA test or Coggins test. And the reasons for this is it's really important to know that that EIA chart goes with that horse. I can't tell you how many times I get a, a EIA test chart where the vet, it's not as bad as it used to be, but for a star, they'll just draw a circle. Versus if they draw the real shape, then I can tell it's that horse. Um, and that might be important if there is a disease outbreak like EHM and they need to trace all the horses then we have pictures of the horses, if they've kept, taken a copy of the Coggins test, that we can go, or we can talk to the state lab, this is the horse that was there, I need a copy of the Coggins test. Um, in some horses, like, like Gracie up there, she has a freeze brand as a standard bread, some have tattoos, some have um, brands for their breeds. And to, to give you a, a reason of why it's important, especially to look at that Coggins test and make sure your horse, grew, your vet drew a good picture, when I first started with vet services, um, that same horse that I was up till 3 a.m. testing horses for had gone to New York State, tested positive for EIA, the stable had a fit, the dealer put the horse back on the trailer and brought it to New Jersey. At the farm in New Jersey, our investigator and I met up with the dealer. He swore up and down that that was not the same horse, that was a different horse. Well, the horse in New York, the vet, had done a really good job drawing it, and it was a done blanket Appaloosa. And the vet had drawn the shape of the blanket and even some of the major spots. And when I drew a Coggins test on that horse and I drew my picture, you could lay my picture right over his. And I was able to say to the dealer, this is the same horse. So rare that that happens, but still important. So at the showgrounds, what might you take with you for biosecurity? And, and again, you know, normally we, we have you fill a bin and uh, when we're all together and you can show me what you would do. But again, it's not bad to have a biosecurity bin for when you are going to equine events. So you wanna have tack, grooming supplies, a spare halter, a spare lead rope, all your show clothing, disinfectant wipes are always good, a fly spray, a thermometer, maybe some emergency medications or a horse first aid box so you could bandage something or uh, you know, give a horse some banamine if you needed to or butte. Um, spray disinfectant, like Lysol, is good because you can spray your tack, you can spray grooming equipment if you need to. If, it's, if the show is near your home and if anything happened to your horse, you'd call your regular vet, make sure you have their phone number with you. If it's a big event, when you check in, find out from the check-in place, if I need the veterinarian that's on the grounds or on call, how do I get them? You go to the check-in booth, is there a different place you go? You know, how, how would you do that? And that's just, I, I don't think I ever asked that when I went to a show with my kids. And it's, it's a good thing to get in the habit of doing. Oops, wrong one, sorry. Ah. Okay, now the slide's not advancing. There we go. So in overall, what does biosecurity do? It keeps your horse from getting sick. It keeps horse illness from entering your farm and from spreading on the farm. So what you wanna do is make a biosecurity plan for your farm. Walk through with a checklist and look at things. When you make that plan, the thing I like on checklists is what are you going to do and who's going to do it? Like you notice that there's 
feed spilled all around the feed bins. Well, you know, so-and-so's the barn person, so it's her job every day to make sure that's swept up. Every day, this is who's gonna do it. And then you wanna walk through again and check that the things have been done. So if it's something new you're putting in place, you might wanna walk through every day for a little while, and then once a week, and then once a month. But I don't think you should do it any less than once a quarter or every three months because people get lax. They may be really good at sweeping up that spilled grain at first, and then they don't bother to sweep kind of underneath the box, and there is some grain under there as well. Or um, something else could happen that you didn't see there when you first went through, and now there's something new that would be a risk to the animals. So that's why it's good to, to keep looking at things quarterly. These are the websites I talked to you about of where you can get information on, on making a biosecurity plan for your farm. Um, the Guelph one is really good. We have a USDA uh, fact sheet. It's not really long. Um, it's just kind of basic. And, and that's why I hope to make a checklist that, that would go with, with that. Again, here's a plug if you want me to talk about um, biosecurity and outbreak planning for equine events. And in summary, really, what's the reason for biosecurity? To me, it's right here in this photo. We love our animals and they're our partners. You know, for, for most people, especially in this area of the country, horses are pets. You know, they're not, they're not equipment. And so you wanna keep them safe and healthy. Again, this picture is why my horse was always vaccinated for botulism. I didn't wanna to have to explain to my daughter why this horse died. So this, um, this is what we, we then did on at Rutgers, but um, this is what you can do. Take a biosecurity list, walk through your farm, make a to-do list, write down who's gonna do what and by when, reevaluate it every quarter, and then maybe also next time your vet's out, just review it with them in case they see something that you didn't see or you didn't think about. And then if you have any, I forgot to stop for questions as we went along. I'm so sorry. I told you I would do that. I'm a Jersey girl. I talk fast and I just keep going. But if you have questions, you can email me or call me at this number um, and I will respond to you. Did we have any questions, Jennifer? <laughs> You know, we have not had any questions entered in the chat, but I would like to invite at this point anyone who has a question for Dr. Serafin on anything that she shared here tonight or anything that she didn't share here tonight um, that you think is related to this topic um, to please put your quick question into the chat and we will uh, share that with Dr. Serafin. And, and I'd especially like if anyone um, has implemented something on their form for biosecurity that they would share that with us. And you know, I think, I think one of the, the biggest issues is, you know, think like the barn where I had my horse, it was, a, it was a boarding facility and lesson facility. So there were people in and out of there all the time. And yeah, we should have had a foot bath, but about the best we could do is tell owners, you know, if you've been to a place with horses, change your clothes, shower, and don't wear those clothes to the barn when you come see your horse, um, you know, but, if you're gonna have an open house, you know, then you could put a foot, a foot bath in. But some of the things are really hard to do. And I don't know if Dr. Malinowski has any comments either, like about some of the things when they did the walkthrough at Rutgers, some of the things that they found difficult. Um, well, it was, it's tough, Leslie, as you know, because of, you know, the carriage brigade that comes through with people from New Brunswick and, and everywhere walking through the place. Right now with COVID, um, everything is closed. I mean, okay. everything is off limits. So all of those gates that we had that were open before, they're all closed. There are signs, do not enter. This is off limits, et cetera. But, uh, you know, it, it's, but the things like, you know, sharing equipment and you were in the um, exercise phys lab where we have those four stalls and you thought that they could be a good isolation place if we did have the case of a horse that was sick and there would be enough distance between any horses that, you know, we, we would be able to accommodate that. So, yeah, we look forward to, uh, to the checklist. And, and again, one of the questions, Dr. Serafin, was could we put that, um, I don't know if Kyle, if you can put that into the chat, the link for the checklist, please. 
Oh, I can go back. So I already put up the one for the uh, Guelph resources. For the rest of them, I'll get all of those links from Dr. Serafin and we'll get them up on our social media as well as our website once the video of the webinar is posted. Great. Thank you know, you. And, and even one good first step for you, for everybody on this talk now, would be to think about where would they isolate a horse if they had to? So one of the first places where I um, boarded my horse, it was 100% pasture board. There were no stalls, but they did have a building with kind of a um, sort of a lean-to type roof and then um, sides where they stored hay. And they could actually remove hay from part of that building and put up gates to make a temporary stall that would isolate the horse. So you might have to be really creative, uh, but think about it. You might, you might be able to come up with something. But you also could use an outdoor paddock or something that's away from other horses. You know, the horse doesn't have to be inside. Uh, that was the other thing I don't think I did talk about. When you come back from a show or you bring in a new horse, how long should you isolate? Ideally, at least two, two times the incubation period. So for most horse diseases, that's 30 days. That's a long time. Two weeks is better than nothing, but 30 days is best. When you bring a horse back from a, a, an event, really two weeks if you can. But again, I don't think most people do that. So Dr. Serafin, I don't know if you saw, but uh, Karen who asked that question about the run and shed, um, also down below put to clarify, um, we own a horse hotel. We are closed now due to COVID, but horses stay in overnight while people travel and she's concerned about the run and shed. If they're in a run and shed and they're just out in a pasture, um, if you can spray, you know, spray and scrub with detergent, and then you can even use something like a, um, a sprayer, like a rose bush sprayer type thing, and you can put disinfectant in that, spray the walls down so they're good and soaked and let it dry. You can't disinfect right the dirt, um, but if you pick up manure and you disinfect at least that part and any buckets horses might be using for feed or water, Every bit helps. Karen, did that, did that answer your full question? Or um, perhaps we don't have a lot of people asking questions. So if you, you need to follow up, you could, we would invite you to unmute yourself and, um, and ask Dr. Serafin directly if you want any more information on that topic. She typed in the chat, yes, that was helpful. Okay, good. I mean, yes, you know, especially if you have wooden fences, you could still have fence contact and that kind of thing. Um, but that might be the thing if you're thinking, gosh, I want to really make sure any horses that come in here don't get sick from my farm. Yes. Um, you know, you might think about putting one strand of electric wire so that they're not going to be leaning on the fence. The In the horse hotel, the paddock that's used for uh, the the customer no horses touch anything. My horses are in a totally different paddock. There's no touching. Good. Um, the horses are outside. The water trough is disinfected with ble a bleach and, and dish detergent solution in between horses. Good. But when you were talking about manure coming from, the horses are coming off a, now they're, they're usually coming from shows. They're coming off a trailer. The people unload the manure in my manure spreader, which isn't near the horses, but still you see the contact from what you were saying. Right. And they're in this, it's a small exercise paddock with a run-in shed. People use their own buckets to feed. They use right. their own food. They have to have their own hay. So I don't worry about that too much. But when you were saying that and I thought, how do I disinfect this run-in shed? I mean, it's a good substantial run-in shed. Yeah, yeah you do. You just have to do the walls the best you can. And if the outside of it, outside walls look dirty, you could do that. The we other thing, power the other wash, thing would, but not in between every horse. Yeah, you maybe, should. Maybe we, right, we had never thought of it. Do think about strangles. That? Think about strangles, right? So it's like, well, I always hope, through. I know, I always hope since they're coming from a show and they've had 9,000 tests, but uh, not necessarily. They're, they're outside by themselves, um, but. The, the other thing that I would recommend on the manure, right. uh, it, it might be better for, for horses that are coming in and staying and leaving. So only manure from your farm goes in that spreader that's gonna be spread back on fields. Okay. And your horses are only being exposed to their own parasites. 
these horses that are coming from anywhere, they could have resistant parasites and be interested introducing those to your population i never thought of, nope. we've had the horse hotel for 20 years we've never had a problem with sick horse. i know but I'm, and we're really pretty neurotic about things being yeah. clean but and we only run it in the summer and the horses are outside they're not in my barn and what you could do with that but, manure, no, i don't want anybody talk, to get sick. talk to like your county agent about making a way to compost any any of that bedding and manure that comes off of that trailer because composting will kill the parasite eggs and it will also we, we the do compost, compost would kill any bacteria too. All right. So so in other words, instead of and we do compost, but sometimes because it's easier for the customers, they just pull right back next to the manure spreader. Right. Yeah, and no. Then they spread. Okay. Compost it first. Make sure it's you know, if you if you have to spread uncomposted manure, make sure it's your own. Okay. Not a visitor's. Yeah. It's but, the, the field that we, that we compost, that we spread in, is our horses never go there. It's a corn field that a neighbor lets us use. Oh, good. So it's a, it's, it's, the horses never are near where we um, spread the, spread the, um, we, we compost until the corn is gone and then we spread. That's basically how we handle it. That's good. All right. That's good. So now, just to ask one more thing. I mean, I usually use sort of like you said, like just a sprayer, like I would spray rose bushes or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I use a 10% bleach solution. If I use that inside the, the um, in the run-in shed, would that be sufficient? It won't do the floor, but it will. Do, it will do the, yeah, it will do the walls. It won't do obviously a dirt floor or pasture, but it will do the walls. Make sure that you spray it enough that that you're spraying long enough that the contact time you want it to be like at least ten minutes or longer. Oh, so wow. you don't want to mist it. Let it dry. Keep spraying it. Turn around. Keep spraying it. You know, let the water run down, basically the disinfectant. This is Jen. I hate to interject here, but we do have one last question. I hate to, <laughs> want to stay on after um, and, and, and follow up with this. We would love to have you follow up a little bit in just a minute, but I want to make sure we get this one last question uh, before we do, because I know some people may have to, uh, may have to leave because we've run a little over time. So I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight um, and for, for, participating in our Rutgers Equine Science Center fall webinar series. And just a reminder that we will be back again in two weeks with Dr. Carrie Williams. Um, and she will be presenting on antioxidant research and its applications for use in exercising horses. Uh, if you have not signed up for that webinar yet, um, you can still register. I think Kyle maybe can throw the link in the, in the chat for us. So make sure you go there and register for that. So thank you all for attending tonight. Um, I just wanted to get that in in case people were leaving. And then I'm going to go to this last question from Elena. She says, is there a type of bedding you recommend that is less likely to spread disease or are they, do they all impact, uh, sorry here, the chat just moved in. Yeah. Or do they all similarly act as fomites? That's a good one. Um, I think the big, the big Dr. Serafin. Yeah. So um, uh, Bob Cossey at the University of Maine is doing some work on our multi-state project with especially microbes in composting. And so I think the research to answer Elena's question hasn't been done yet. But there are people working on it, Elena. So uh, maybe we'll have that answer for you soon. And then, just just from a practical standpoint, I would say, you know, any bedding that's that's not going to allow wet areas and moldy areas to develop and stay, um, I think you're right, Dr. Malinowski. Bedding that would compost well would be good. Um, I know some people still bed deeply with straw, and one of the problems with straw is that if you then spread it over the ground. You know how when you'll see places that are newly have new, new grass you put down and they would spread, spread straw? That holds enough water for mosquitoes. So not necessarily in the stall with the horse, will it? But if you're spreading it out over an area flat, it might. So um, that, that's, a good, that, that's a good study for a grad student too, Dr. Malinowski. Do we have any other questions, Jennifer? No, we do not have any other questions in the chat box. I think you've covered everything. Um, 
and and again, if you would if you would like me to, if you have a, a larger group that you would like a similar presentation for, or or the one on equine events, if you're running the equine event, um, that is something that I can do, and I can, I can do it remotely right now. Um, and and this is your tax dollars at work since I'm a federal employee, so this is one of the things you pay me to do. Thank you all for attending. Thank you.